honor and privilege to introduce a discussion amongst two giants. Please welcome Jamie Ian Swiss and Richard Dawkins. since last spring at Michael Shermer's home. A lot has happened since then. And many people ask, I would be remiss if I didn't ask, how is your health, sir? Please forgive me if I croak. Can you hear me? <laughs> can, you, can you get him a little hotter so he doesn't have to strain his voice? It's a little weak right today. So she went into the garden to pick a cabbage leaf to make it. <laughs> It's all right, we'll get it right. We're pretending we're in Pam, nothing works. Um, this, this is dead. Pardon me, Richard, you now I'm picking your pocket. Um, it's on, he's got a green light, and his mic is dead. So, and so they can edit all of that out, back on YouTube. It's great to see you again. I think, I, think, uh, I think the last time we were together was at Michael Sherman's last spring. A lot has happened since then, and uh, many people ask, and I would be remiss if I did not ask. How's your health, sir? Please forgive me if I croak. <laughs> I just had a minor stroke. <laughs> Basal ganglion on the right makes me walk as if I'm tight. <laughs> So if I fall to groans and croaking, Jamie, you must do the talking. <laughs> Before you made a public statement, but similar, it was very similar. You were your invariable self. You were your invariable, rational, curious self. Um, there was nothing about how awful it was or how awful you felt. There was just, well, it's interesting. I'm looking into this, and I'm told this, and I'm not sure about and it. And I'm going to see how I see how the, the brain rewires itself. And you took it as, as as a scientist, as the inveterate, inveterate curiosity seeker. Well, the basal ganglion doesn't affect higher cognitive functions, and um, I'm delighted to say, I hope I can bear that out today. Uh, um, but it, it was a bit scary. Um, I found I couldn't use my left hand, I couldn't pick things up, or if I could pick them up, I couldn't let them go again. Um, I was staggering around, I couldn't stand up straight, couldn't go downstairs. Um, my voice started croaking, and it's still, still is, as you can hear. Uh, I found I couldn't sing, um, which was no great hardship. I didn't need to sing for my career. <laughs> Were you much of a singer before? I sang as a treble in the, in the choir at school, in the chapel, um, sacred music, uh, and when my voice broke, I could still sing in tune, but I wasn't any good, but now I, I can't even do that. Um, I regard it a kind of litmus test, when I can sing again, I'll, I'll, I'll say I can't even do that. And the limit on singing, is that being able to find pitch, or is that a physical limitation in your I think, it, I think it's in the voice, yes. I can play an instrument. I can, oh, I can okay. play an instrument by ear, and that's not in there at all. What do you play? Well, I, I now play the e <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Electronic wind instrument. Um, it's, it's a long thing like a clarinet or a oh. bow. You stick it in your mouth, and the other end is a wire that goes to a computer. 
and you play it like an oboe or a clarinet, like that. But what comes out of the computer depends on the software. So it can sound like a clarinet, or an oboe, or a tuba, or a trumpet, or a violin, or a cello, um, which is wonderful because. Uh, you can't play any of those. <laughs> As you know, when you start learning to play the violin, it sounds awful. Right. When you play it on the Ewe, it sounds wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> You've got this perfect sort of high fits vibrato, um, and when you tongue it, you, go tuck, 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 you get the zing of the bow. Of the oh, yes, right. On the the attack, the attack of the bow. And you just play perfectly the very first time you start playing it. We'll be able to all use a little post production. <laughs> <laughs> and one, one more on this. After spending three years writing your memoirs, or more or less, or more, and then sort of after that, or right after that, you have your stroke. And one way or another, did, did either or both together make you, lead you to think a little more about one's mortality? Yes, I suppose so. I mean, um, obviously having a stroke makes you, makes you think that. Um, and uh, writing an autobiography will look back. Um, and uh, I, mean, I chose to, to write my autobiography when I did, partly because my mother was still alive and still is still alive. She's 99, she's 100 in November. Um, so she was available for me to ask questions about my early childhood, and that was wonderful. Um, so, yes, I mean, I, I, I was led to think about mortality. Um, I think what's, if, if there's anything frightening about mortality, it's probably the idea of eternity. And eternity is something, if it's frightening, you best spend it under a general anaesthetic, <laughs> uh, which is what's going to happen to all of us. Um, so I think eternity is only really frightening if you imagine spending, actually living through eternity. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and the last one is, I remember now thinking about those early emails from you. Uh, you sent me a photo of a, like a, a little piece of plastic with a bunch of holes in it, in which you had to thread an arm through yes. as a, as a uh, physical therapy task. And I remember you saying something about, uh, you wrote something like, a, I forget, embarrassed to say how, uh, what, what a sense of accomplishment this Yeah, I was very well treated. I had physical physiotherapy every day for six weeks. A woman came to my house for six weeks, all free of the national health, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> And um, occupational therapy, I had to do this stupid threading thing. Yes. And, and um, I had to do it left handed, which is the original problem. Um, I'm still a lot better with my right hand than my left hand. But you managed, you managed to type. Uh, I, I remember type, that was your first real yeah. frustration. I, I can't tweet! I don't. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not allowed to tweet. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it's bad for the blood pressure. <laughs> Typing, I can still type fast, I can touch type, but left hand is very inaccurate, so I have to go back and correct everything with my right hand afterwards. Oh, interesting, interesting. Not speed, but just accuracy. Yeah. So, um, in a completely different direction, we know that, we kind of know what the big questions are that physicists and astrophysicists are looking at, origin of the universe, the Big Bang, expanding universe. What about the remaining questions in biology? What are big questions or a big question in biology that you think of? The biggest of all, I suppose, has got to be the neurobiology of subjective consciousness, um, which is a deeply mysterious problem. Uh, we all have it. Presumably several other species have it as well. It must have evolved by natural selection um, and said something about the brain that does it. Um, our most advanced computer programs, which can do things like play chess to grandmaster standards, I don't think anybody thinks they're conscious. Um, but, so there, there it is, it's a thing that brains do, and it's a thing that evolution has achieved, 
and it's a thing that we really don't understand. So, um, and what about, and I think these two questions are related, what about art in the lab? I mean, we're still making attempts to recreate life in the lab, as it were, and develop the moments that we jump, yes, from, I mean, we jump from one thing to another. One, once you had genes, once you had um, high fidelity, self-replicating molecules in the world, it's quite philosophically interesting because I, I expect you were all here to see Jamie's apt. There were some folks who did only came in today. Okay, well, um, I mean, miracles were performed on stage. <laughs> now, we know they were not miracles, but, but that's only because we know that Jamie's honest and he tells us that they're not, they're not miracles. There are frauds out there who do the same kind of tricks not so well and claim that they are miracles. They were so called paranormal. Now, when you think about the reason why most people are religious believers, it's because of miracles. Jesus turned water into wine. It'd be child's play for Jamie. So <laughs> that old thing. <laughs> Loads of the fishes. Walking all the time. So BC. Yeah. <laughs> um, I used to pay lip service to the view that it would be easy to convince me of the existence of God. It would only take. Uh, some, you know, some voice in the clouds to say, you know, he, Paul wrote some voice, I am here, I am God. Um, and I thought that obviously I would then be with God. I'm not, I'm not so sure. I mean, what, if, you, if we apply Hume's criteria, which is more likely that, it, that it's something supernatural, a miracle, or that there's some trickery, if not an, an, an earthly conjurer, some extra conjurer, um, or that I'm hallucinating, or that I'm dreaming, or that I'm drunk, or, or any, any of those sorts of things. I find it rather hard to set out a scenario that would actually convince me that, 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 that God exists. And it's partly because of conjurers that I, that I feel that. <laughs> but we often ask believers, well, what would convince you? Uh, what would talk you out of your belief? So do we really want to be in this position of well, saying, there's nothing that we can do. Well, I, I don't think I'll talk them under. I mean, I, I just want them to, to, to admit there is no positive reason for their belief. Right. Um, and um, I suppose uh, I'm worried now because I've said that there could be no positive reason. But, um, I don't know. I mean, I, that, that's an idle speculation that, that, that one cannot think of something that really would convince one. Right. But I, I well, the think. burning bush wouldn't do it for you. Talking, talking burning bush? <laughs> Burning bush is too easy. I, I, I do think, um, yeah, the sort of 900 foot Jesus descending out of the clouds, that, that might do it. I guess I'll let Dr. Who. But it does look supernatural, so and it, it's, I think it's a sanitary lesson. Yeah. Yes, it is a lesson. And that's, and that's actually the lesson that magicians, that's the reason magicians have been involved in critical thinking for as long as it's been record of uh, I often point to the discovery of witchcraft, 1584, classic Elizabethan text, which uh, questions the evidence for witch burnings of James in England. But it doesn't say, given that it's 1584, he doesn't say there's no such thing as witches. What he does say is he questions the evidence that was being used at the time to convict witches. To me, that makes him a skeptic. Well, it's interesting that um when the, that um, homeopathy paper was published in Nature, Ben Benice, yes. um, and the editor of Nature then um, engaged the services of Randy and um, a couple of other mm -hmm. people to go and investigate. That's right. Uh, so he actually chose a conjurer to go and investigate um, right. this, and from this the claim of, of um, homeopathy. Yeah, and at the birth of uh, parapsychological research, in the early 20th century, when the Scientific American magazine organized the committee, Harry Houdini was a member of that. And from the time of Harry Houdini to Randy and beyond, magicians are basically always said to scientists, if you're studying, especially parapsychologists, if you're studying something where deception <laughs> might be involved, you need an expert on deception. All of the academic training in the world 
does not make you any more immune to that. I mean, the, the spoon that is notoriously fool scientists. Yes, absolutely. And physicists are the ones who will come up with these elaborate explanations. There yes. were many at the time when, when Geller first showed up on the scene, there were many scientists who were taken in, and then they, or the ones who didn't believe, they came up with cockamamie explanations as using special chemicals and heat on the hands and all of this, um, because the explanations of, of magic are often counterintuitive.